Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and today we are sitting down with American author Stephen Murray. Stephen, thank you so much for doing this. This is uh, greatly appreciated because I've had the chance to read your book, and now it's time to talk to you about your, you and your writing style. So I feel like I'm excited to do this interview for the first time in a while. So thank you for sitting down and doing this. Oh, Chris, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on your show. And I certainly hope that the listeners enjoyed as much as I know I'm going to enjoy being on your program. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, for every writer that I've ever had on the show, I asked them the same question to start off the interview. And the question is, where does your writing style come from? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not an author. It's not like I went to any writing classes or anything like that. I just took English. At, high school and English literature, of course. Um, I came to writing pretty much late in life. And it was only as I approached retirement years that I even started to write. And the first book was a biography, never got published. Uh, but I was told to write for fiction. And I just put pen to paper and started writing. And fortunately, some people are moved by it. Not everybody is, but uh, people seem to enjoy the books, which is the main thing. You know, it gives people pleasure. So talk, let's talk about that moment when you decided to start publishing, because uh, writing and publishing are two different things. You can write as much as you want, but the moment you actually say, okay, I think this is good enough to put it out there, then it becomes the bigger challenge. And the bigger challenge meaning you have to feel comfortable in your own skin to actually put something out there that people will buy, pick up, and read. So when you wrote your first book that you published, was it hard? Was it was there difficulty to actually say, okay, I think this is good enough to put out there? Or was there always a hesitation with anything that anyone does to put something out there for the public consumption? Oh, Chris, mine was totally the opposite um, aspect. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, I wrote my biography, uh, my travels throughout the world, um, which I thought would be interesting. But a publisher said, oh, those things don't sell. Nobody reads those. And uh, if you really want to sell something, write women's fiction. And that kind of took me back because I thought, well, I know nothing about women's fiction, nothing whatsoever. I don't read women's fiction. I've never read a Daniel Steele book or anything like that. So I had discovered a joy of writing. And I thought, I'm going to see if I can do this. So as a challenge, I wrote my first book, The Chapel of Eternal Love, Wedding Stories from Las Vegas. It's fiction, and it's a series of short stories woven together into a novel. Um, but I just wrote to see if I could do it, and I put it in the back of the computer for two years, and I wrote A Murder Mystery, which is the one that you've been reading, I know, and that was the one I took to get published. And the company that helped me, they said, have you written anything else? I said, well, I'd written this book about a wedding chapel. And they said, that's the one you've got to get out, get that one out there. And I said, oh, I don't think it's that good. I didn't even have a title for it. Um, but they were the ones that pushed me into doing it. And no, I didn't feel very confident about it at all. I didn't have the confidence in the book, uh, but they were the experts. And so I went with their judgment. And very gingerly put it out there and much to my pleasant surprise it started getting great reviews and it got some awards and things like that so no I did not have the confidence at all Chris um, I was not one of those certainly not in the first book that got pushed out um, now, now that first book that you did release uh, Chapel of Eternal Love um, you have released uh, other books as well, including the one we're going to be talking about today, which is right here, Murder Above yes. uh, Aboard the Queen Elizabeth II. Um, yes. you, you say you didn't have uh, confidence to put out the first book, but did it become easier the second and third book? Because you get sort of a sense after the first book you publish, you can start doing this a little bit easier, or was it still, was there still some hesitation? Uh, I think that... It does become easier. I think you're absolutely right, Chris. Well, it certainly did for me. It became easier. Um, it, after the Chapman book came out, again, I was very pleasantly surprised and very humbled. It is about why people come to Las Vegas to get married. Um, we are the marriage capital of the world, after all. Um, 
And people started emailing and say, well, what happened to this couple? What happened to that couple? And that was a total surprise because I didn't think anybody would care what happened to these fictional people. So I then had to come out. My second published book was um, Return to the Chapel of Eternal Love that revisits all the couples in the first book and where their paths have taken them over a period of five years. So that was kind of fun to put out. And it was challenging too, because I hadn't expected it. So it was interesting having to come up with follow-up stories for each of these couples. So the murder mystery was the third one that finally came out. It's amazing what you learn, Chris, as you go. And I went back and did some major re well, not major, I did some rewriting of um, the book as a result of what I'd learned and what um, the readers tell you what they want too and what works for them, what doesn't. And I found that very helpful in all of the subsequent books that I wrote and have put out. But they've all been challenging. And yes, the first one was a little bit nerve wracking. I did not have the confidence in it. I wish I did. But I felt better about the other ones as they've come out. You In the book, Murder Aboard the Queen Elizabeth II, uh, as I read the first few chapters, I felt like I was in the story. I felt like I was actually there. And it is very hard. It's not often that I can actually read something where I feel like I'm part of the storyline, where I'm actually in the room with the main characters. And you have such a good knack of doing that. In the whole story, in the story, the parts of the, about, like, like I said to you at the beginning of the interview, I read 98% of the book because I don't want to spoil it because I'm the worst at spoiling things for people. So <laughs> it, for the 98% of the book that I read, I, I look at it and I go, I, I feel like I'm there. I'm feeling like I'm with the detective. I'm feeling like I'm there with the, uh, sorry, my, my apologies, but I feel like I'm there with Beverly and Brian. I feel like I'm there, not Beverly, sorry, Sylvia and uh, Brian. Sorry, my mind's been on the fritz this morning. <laughs> How That's do you okay. write such engaging and colorful pieces? How, has, how does that flow from your hand? Is it something that you've always been able to do when you've written books like this or written stories or short stories or even when you were writing your bi biography? You have the knack to put someone in that place where you're talking about where does that come from um i don't know that's very kind of you to say that brian and i hope that is the case that's what i try to do it's something that doesn't come naturally it um all of the characters i really dig deep inside all of each of one of the characters i try and make them unique and very different and i have to dig deep, deep, deep dig deep inside to find out if I've got those emotions that I'm conveying in the book. And that's not, that's not easy to do. But that's the challenge and that's the fun part. Where it actually comes from, I don't know. It's just something I feel I need to convey this character in this book, what their temperament's like, what their personalities are like. Are they jealous? Are they devious? Are they honest? Are they trustworthy? I try and find out and get these characteristics and try and again make them unique and different so they're easily identifiable as you're reading through the book. And sometimes, hopefully, just through the dialogue, I don't have to say who it is who's talking. You will know because you've been able to give, uh, relate to the character. And you, you give your character such a personality that you you feel like you could become friends with these people and that's what i found often while i was reading was i was like i could hang out with that person i could go have a beer with this person i could go go have dinner with this person and every time that i there was a twist in the book and yet again i don't want to spoil it because i really hope people do go and out and pick this up because it is a fantastic story for the 98 percent that i've read but I, i'm hoping that i will be ending it probably by the end of uh, tonight but you, you write people so passionately and so eloquently that it feels like these people are your friends. When I, I look at authors, when they write people that they're making up, it feels like these are people living inside your head. Is that true? Like, do you have conversations with Sylvia, with Brian to talk to them and say, okay, what would you say at this time? Or how do you come up with character development? Um. 
Well, that that again, really, that really is the challenge, and that's the fun part of it. And I think trying to write for women is certainly the first couple of books were the murder mystery, not quite so much, but um, trying to get inside women's minds while well, trying to get inside of anybody's mind isn't necessarily easy but trying to think how women think from uh, as a male it's not easy i would imagine female authors have the same issue trying to figure out uh how men think but it's particularly difficult for me uh to develop the female characters it really is a lot of hard work i put a lot of time and effort into it I hope I make them them credible. Um, in the murder book, and of course, a lot of the characters, they're kind of a motley crew in a way, because as you know in the book, they've all got reasons for, for killing each other. So that's what made this book interesting, because I didn't want the murder to take place in the first or second chapter, as it does in so many murder books. And you spend the rest trying to figure out who did it. I tried to make this one where they all had reasons for killing each other. And so it's like a twofer in a way. Um, the first part, you're trying to figure out who's going to get killed, which one of this group's going to get killed. And then the second part, okay, now we know the victim, who done it and why, uh, what was the motive. So I tried something different, uh, which I think is unusual for most murder mysteries because the murder takes place so late. So why, but, um, why, why did you do that? Worked. Why, why, why did you make a conscious decision to do that? Because like you said, the stereotypical murder mystery book or movie is, hey, the person dies within the first 10 minutes or the first two chapters and then the rest of it is you deciding. But you've made that conscious decision to bring the, uh, uh, the readers along for the story to say, here's the characters, here's the reasons why these people might be, uh, kill certain people. And then you spring it upon us, okay, this is the person that dies. Um, I think because I wanted to try and do something different. I wanted to set it aside from the average murder mystery book that comes out. And I shouldn't use the word average, but perhaps the typical murder mystery that comes out where the murder does take place so early in the books. I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to cast doubt on who the actual victim was going to be so that um, it would give the, the reader an added aspect of enjoyment, especially if they like sleuthing and analyzing situations and people's dialogues. I thought it would just add a nice different dimension. You, you, you said that your first two books that you did publish were those the female lead, uh, so female uh, centric uh, storylines for female readers. You have gone completely sort of 180 with this book. I want you to take a moment and tell my uh, listeners and to my viewers, what is Murder Aboard the Queen Elizabeth II? Ta like, give us a synopsis of the book because I could do it, but from the author's mouth himself, what is Murder on aboard the Queen Elizabeth II? Oh, um, a murder aboard the Queen Elizabeth II. It's about a very, very wealthy Beverly Hills couple that is celebrating their silver wedding anniversary. Uh, he's a music mogul. He's made his money in the music industry. And they decide to celebrate their silver wedding anniversary aboard the Queen Elizabeth II with their very dysfunctional family. They've got a son and a daughter that are highly dysfunctional and um, with different spouses and uh, the girls got married and um, her husband's pretty unpopular with the family and the son's got a girlfriend who's also unpopular with, certainly with uh, the mother. Um, plus some of their close friends from the music industry. So it's quite a diverse group of characters and as I said, they celebrate on the QE2, and as they're sailing across from Southampton to New York, one of the party gets murdered, and then the rest of the book is figuring out who done it and why. And of course, it's got to be solved before the ship docks in New York, um, because otherwise the parties all scatter. And it just so happens there's a retired detective on board who helps with the, the captain solve the murder mystery. 
you, I said you... about the Queen Elizabeth II. Um, originally, I came up with this idea. It was a game to play at a dinner party that I had with my business partner. And um, it was just a fun game. And I thought, I'd, I'd like to expand this into a book. But I did not know enough about what it was like living in a Beverly Hills mansion. But I had had the good fortune to go on the Queen Elizabeth II. So I just thought, well, you know, well, let me just transport this storyline. And instead of doing it in the Beverly Hills mansion, have them all go on the QE2 to celebrate. And that'll make it a little bit more fun and interesting. Now, you, 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 open, and you open the book with, like you said, a colorful family uh, led with Brian and Sylvia. And within the first 10 minutes, you know how dysfunctional this family is when they're just trying to set up where everyone is going to be on the boat. And the, when I read that part, I was laughing out loud. And my partner looked at me and said, what are you laughing at? And I said, you have to read this book afterwards because the opening chapter is just hilarious. I, I got to ask the question because usually life imitates art. How is your family life? Is your family this dysfunctional? Because you seem to write a dysfunctional family quite well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you, uh, Chris, I am single. Um, I my parents were divorced. I have a brother, and and I had a I had a brother, and I have a sister. Um, we all live in different parts of the globe. When my dad was alive, he lived in England. My brother and my mother lived in Australia. My sister lives in South Africa, and I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So it's not like we have too many close family reunions. And I left home when I was when I finished boarding school uh, in Southern Africa. I left home like 17 and a half. So I've always been kind of separated, if you will, from the family. Um, pluses and minuses, depending on what your family's like, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, so uh, take me through the process of writing a mystery because you, you talked about how this was not a typical uh, mystery novel like like we said the, the the murder doesn't happen right at the beginning it happens relatively at the sort of the peak of the book and then at the the ending of the book is trying to solve who it is and who's who uh, committed the murder um i, I want to take through the process of actually writing in a mystery like this because a, an author you have to probably set out okay, you have X, Y, and Z of who you're going to potentially kill. Or for you, was it just you knew going into it right away that this person was going to die, this was going to happen? Or ha like, take me through the process of writing a mystery because I, I, I've i read it and I've read, part like, like I said, the majority of it. I'm looking at this and I'm going, how the hell did he keep everything straight? Pardon my French. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, I knew from the outset um who was going to be the victim mm -hmm. and who was going to be the murderer. I did know that from the outset. And I did know um, the major, uh, the, the family that was going to be involved. And some of the other couples, um, they kind of came in as I started to write, I thought, oh, you know what? I need this kind of character in it. And I need this, couple to add some balance and so on and so forth. Um, I had a rough idea, but I didn't know absolutely from the outset who was going to be the victim and uh, who was going to be the murderer. That I definitely knew. Um, when and you read so, some, of the, on, sorry. some of the motives for some of the characters, um, I didn't have all the motives for them each killing each other when I first started. But once I got beyond the first two chapters, um, I thought, oh, this can be this person's motive. This, this person needs to do this and have this kind of relationship with that person to, um, to generate this kind of motive, to arouse suspicion. Um, but it also brings into play the question you touched on earlier. Do you get voices in your head? <laughs> do these characters talk to you? And absolutely, they do, and it's kind of strange because it sounds silly when you say you hear voices. Um, people think you're nuts, but they do. And even when you're, when I'm writing the dialogue, I get so far along with the typing, and this voice kind of pops into the head and says, 
don't be silly, I would never use that word, or I would never say it like that, and I have to backspace and retype. So it sounds silly, but I think because these characters, certainly for as long as you're writing the book, become so much of a part of your life for so long, you know, and you don't write the book an entire day, it takes quite a while. So these characters have got to live with you and you've got to remember and keep all their personalities distinct and separate. So you don't botch it up when you come back to write the next chapter. Now, you you would look at a story like this and think, okay, setting it on a boat is probably one of the cha most challenging things you might have to do. Because if you set it in a town, you set it in a location like a hotel, people can come and go as you please. But you consciously chose, and you said beginning at, uh, earlier on in the interview that you chose because you have to solve the mystery within a time frame. Bef like they leave Southampton, they have to solve it before they get to New York. You, you, you have created a world within the Queen Elizabeth II that every single time that someone new pops up into the story, you get a sense that, okay, I can see this person on the ship. I can see this person doing this. You, you, you have a flow within your writing style, which I have not seen within a lot of writers. And I know I'm, I'm not trying to toot your own horn. I'm not trying to toot your horn right now. Mm -hmm. I honestly think it's a fantastic read and I hope everyone does go out and uh, pick it up. But for someone who started so late in life writing a story, it feels like if you read this book, you've been doing it for your entire life. And I'm not just saying last 10 years, I'm saying probably in the like, last 50 years, it seems, seems like you've been writing. How have you been able to write three amazing books? And I've uh, more books, I apologize, sorry, but how have you been able to write amazing books that are able to capture a world within itself? And I keep on coming back to this because I wanna make sure people know you are a fantastic writer. Well, I appreciate those kind words, uh, Chris, I truly do. And it's always very heartwarming when you get nice people that do appreciate the book because writing, it does all boil down to style. You know, we don't all like the same thing. That's why we have menus in restaurants because we, we all like different choices. We like different styles, different tastes. Um, I think as it relates to QE2, you will note that the book was set back in time. It was set back in the late 80s. You know, Brian, um, he was very part of the British invasion of, and that's how he made his money. And he met his wife in the early part of that British invasion. And they've now been married 25 years. So we know it's in the late 80s. And that's when I went on the QE2. As it happened, I was on the Queen Elizabeth II by myself. So I had spent a lot of time with myself just soaking up the atmosphere of the Queen Elizabeth II, savoring the restaurants, um, going and spending some time by the swimming pool, um, all the things that happen. It was a very, very memorable experience. And I think that's what I tried to convey in the book, um, you know, the luxury of it. And When you were writing, did, you, did it feel like you were back there? as that person oh, back absolutely. on the QE2, because like I absolutely, said- Absolutely, you... because it's it's all changed now, you know. Well, one, I know they refurbished it. That's why I had to put it back in the late 80s because I remember the names of the um, of the restaurants and I'm sure that the names of the restaurants have all changed, as have the suites. I'm sure they've all changed names. And uh, But I wanted it to be authentic and that's why I put it back there because I could remember it also well and so vividly and now i don't know what it's like i believe the ship's docked in the zone by the government of dubai so who knows what's going on with it now um i i have to ask the question because like i said i i am a fan of this book and i'm i'm hoping 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 that i can convince you to write a sequel to it <laughs> so is there potentially oh going to be a murder aboard the queen elizabeth the second two uh, I, I haven't planned them. I have been asked that several times. Um, it would have to be with a whole s separate set of characters, though. Um, you couldn't bring all the characters back, um, or certainly the same characters back to be on, 
on the, the ship. Um, some people have suggested I, I use the detective and have him like a, an Hercule Poirot or a Miss Marple kind of thing where they keep popping up all over the place or a Jessica Fletch um, from Murder, She Wrote. I don't know. Um, there's other, th well, I went on to, as you know, to write a fourth book and I'm now writing a fifth book that's um, uh, a Christmas story, one of these mushy Christmas stories, something totally different. You just sparked and, my interest. Uh, I love Christmas and I love books. Might be buying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in being edited right now. It's the shortest book, but um, I, I like writing in different genres. You know, the first two are mainstream fiction. They were love books. They're not romance. They're love books, uh, books about love, I should say. Then there was the murder mystery. Then there was the crime fiction, discreetly yours. And this is now just going to be a warm, fuzzy Christmas book. Being a writer who is not uh, pigeonholed to one narrative or one type of genre of books must be liberating. And you must be, feel like you can write whatever you want, because like you said, you have four books that are out right now. You're writing the fifth book. It's being edited. But they are some from different uh, genres. When you set out to write books, I know you started with a biography, but you went into that non uh, the, the mm -hmm. fiction books. Did you think, OK, I'm going to just write and I, whatever I write, I love and I put out? Or was it I'm going to try to do everything and hope for the best? Well, um, the, the nice thing is it's a hobby. You know, it's not like something I've got to do for a living. So um, as I said, it's nice if people buy your books and you get positive feedback saying that people liked it. That's all very nice because that, that's what makes it worth it. Um, but it does give you the, the liberty absolutely to, to write what you want. It's not like I'm tied into a publisher that says, When's your next murder mystery coming out? We've got to have a follow-up murder mystery. You know, I, I don't have to follow those kind of rules or laws. Um, that's what kind of makes it fun. So for me, it's a hobby. Um, have you enjoyed the hobby? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I first wrote, um, as I said, when I wrote the biography, I never really thought I was going to write anymore, but it was through that I discovered a joy of writing. Then, of course, um, you know, I wrote the tap of book or went into the computer, but it came out. And I think I kind of got a little bit swept away, you know, even when the tap of book first came out and I had a website developed and I realized that people were starting to like the book and appreciated the character development. It kind of spurred me, spurred me on to get the murder book out. And then once that came out, I already had my idea for my next book, my crime fiction book. Um, I couldn't wait to sort of start putting pen to paper and working on that. But it does take time. There's no question about it. It's taking time. You've got to keep going back and doing re rewrites. Fortunately, I'm in a group, in a critique group with four other authors. Um, and we have to take something every two weeks when we meet, we have to take something we've written. So that keeps you forging ahead. And we kind of, we're all there to support each other and encourage each other. So that helps you sometimes when you get a little bit discouraged or frustrated and you think, God, this isn't moving as fast as I'd like, or I can't get this character quite right. They help you. So um, that's a terrific source of support and encouragement uh, to get to the next book finished and out there. I want to talk about being an author in 2021. Being an author in 2021 has got to be probably one of the hardest things to do because there are many other people like yourself out there trying to publish their own books as well. You have uh, done it. You have done it not just once, but now potentially coming up on five times once the new book comes out. What advice would you give authors, the people who are thinking about writing a book tomorrow to say, hey, this is what you need to do to potentially become a published author. What would you, what advice would you give those up and coming authors right now, or even people like yourself who started writing late in their life? Well, a, a couple of things. I think probably the most important thing is one, don't give up on your dream. 
if it's something you 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 really want to do and you it's a passion pursue it yes there's going to be drawbacks there's going to be setbacks there's going to be unexpected things happen but the writing getting these books published has taken me on a journey i never ever imagined it's been wild it's been wonderful it's been exciting it's been fun i've met some amazing people which has made it worth the while as it relates to the practical side um if they're writing a book the one two things i would suggest is one get in a critique group and if you're in a town you don't know any other authors do a google search on writers group in your town you'll find one go along and see if there are people who are in a critique group that are accepting new members otherwise start your own it's so important to get other people's perspectives certainly as an aspiring writer if you're stephen king or daniel still or john grisham you probably don't need it but it's very important to get feedback and you don't want to go too far down a road in your book and find you tripped up and missed something out that might be obvious to you as an author but the reader doesn't quite get it because you've left something out. Um, so it's very important to get an extremely good editor. Uh, make a very conscious decision as to whether you're going to self-publish or go traditional. There's pluses and minuses to both, and I'll try and summarize it as quickly and as briefly as possible. Um, if you go to a publisher, the advantages that are is that they will get your book out there, they will support you. They will help you supposedly with the marketing. I don't believe that's quite so prevalent now as it used to be, but at one time they would get behind and organize your book signings. Uh, the flip side is as a self-publishing author, you have to do it all yourself. All the marketing you actually have to do. Um, you've got to arrange your own book signings, you've got to find podcasts, uh, you've got to design your own websites, do all your own promotion. All of that stuff has to come from you. The plus side is uh, you get the final say on the cover. Uh, you get the final say on the text. You own the rights. And I'm hoping that one or all of my books will ultimately land up on a Hallmark movie or Disney Channel or Netflix or something like that. I will own all the rights. I will have the final say. And if you're a published author, Sometimes, if you're not careful, a lot of those rights are signed away in the contract. Um, so uh, the hard, and also when you go through a tr traditional publisher, there's no real upfront expense, but you don't make that much money on each book sold either. As a self-publishing author, there's a huge amount of upfront expense. You've got to pay for your own cover design, your own printing, your typesetting, your editing, your website. Any promotional pieces you put out, there's a huge amount of money up front, but then you get most of the money back, you know, that from each book, you get a huger percentage than if you've gone with a traditional publisher. So I hope that's been some help to aspiring authors to get a perspective. Like I said, 2021 is a challenging year because of with everything that's gone on in the last uh, 18 months with COVID-19. We don't need to talk about the ins and outs of COVID-19, but I got to ask, has COVID-19 given you the opportunity to write a little bit more and get a little bit more done that you want it to? Because a lot of people were locked down. I know down in Nevada, there was uh, some lockdowns as well. And when you're locked mm -hmm. down, you don't really have much else to do, but your hobby. So were you able to write a little bit more during COVID, uh, during the lockdown, during the pandemic? Um, as it happened personally, for me, no. I think for a lot of people, you're probably absolutely right. They did have that extra time on their hands, were able to do it. I had some personal issues where I had to do... Um, do some caregiving every day that took a huge chunk of my day time out of my day and I still do work you know I still have a job true it's not 40 hours a week but I still have a job so by the time I took away the caregiving hours in the job um, I didn't have as much time uh, as I, I would apologize have. for asking that question I just no did. that's no, it's, no that's all right no apologies necessary it's a it's a legitimate question um, no apologies necessary. 
my last question before we do our, our wrap up here, Stephen, is uh, your fans. I, I did some research on you. I, I, I looked at some of the uh, comments that people have given on your books and not just the murder aboard the Queen Elizabeth II, but all your books. You have a good mm -hmm. following. People seem to like your writing. What does that mean to mm -hmm. an author like yourself who started so late that people have gravitated towards your books? It's very humbling. It's extremely humbling. Um, I, I never expected to get some of the reviews, some of the emails. I just never dreamed it. And as I said, I never even had confidence in the first book uh, to even get it published. So it's extremely gratifying, but it is very, very humbling. And there's something when somebody sends you an email and um, they might say something like, my husband was in hospital and while I was in the waiting room, I was reading your Chapel of Eternal Love book and it took my mind off it and it was a great comfort or things like that. That's where it's very re rewarding. I think that as a, a self-published author, you don't really make the money back that you put into it. It's, it's nothing that you're going to become a millionaire on overnight, that's for sure. So the rewards are the fact that you may have touched somebody's life and made it a little bit better. And that's all we all try to do, isn't it? Just make our little corner of the globe a little bit of a happier place. And um, if my books have made that happen for some people, it's just great, but it's very humbling. Well, I can say that during the last month, when uh, I would, originally we were supposed to be doing this in July, but we had to push it back. But uh, mm -hmm. over the last month, I got some bad news and this book was able to take me into a different world and a different zone. And I highly recommend anyone who is listening to this, who is uh, watching this to consider going out and getting murder aboard the queen elizabeth ii or any of other steve uh, other stephen's books but I, I gotta ask the question though where can people pick, pick up the books where can people buy the books stephen um well of course they're, they're available on amazon um for the the travel books and certainly murder aboard the queen elizabeth ii they can walk into any bookstore if they're in the united states borders um Sorry, Barnes and Noble, I mean. I'm not too sure what um, what bookstores you have there in Calgary or in Canada, what chain stores you have. But they are distributed through Ingram Spark internationally. So they can get them anywhere in the world. You can just go in. If they don't have it in stock, they can order it. If they would like signed copies, they can reach out. They can go to my author website, um, www.author. Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y dot com. And they can certainly uh, purchase them through my website. So I'll be happy to sign them, send them anywhere. If you want them gifts to anybody, be happy to sign them as gifts to people. Um, for my viewers and to my listeners, the links to purchase uh Stephen's books will be in the show notes. Please, 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 please. If you are a book lover like I am, and then I would turn around my uh, camera and I'd show you the big giant wall of books that I have, go out, purchase this book. This is an amazing book, Murder Aboard the Queen Elizabeth. Murder Aboard the Queen Elizabeth II. I would highly recommend you picking it up because, like I said, it is a book that you will be transported into this location this world and you will laugh like i did a few times at this book and <laughs> at some of the dysfunctions it will make your fa make you look like your family is actually quite normal when you read some of the stories <laughs> um Stephen, i did try I and put some humor into it i think <laughs> when you've got a heavy murder mystery book it's nice to have some humor in there so i did try and put some in there to lighten it up in parts and bring a smile now, I am going to wrap up here because, like I said, I have about 
two chapters left of this book that I want to figure out who murdered. I'm going to pick Stephen's brain here off the record so that way I can sort of ask him who I think did it and then he'll tell me no probably because I'm completely out to lunch. Um, but <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a blast. And like I said to my listeners and viewers, please, 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 please look at the links below, get the book. You won't be sorely uh, upset with my recommendation here. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure and I hope your listeners enjoyed it as much as I did.